a number of months ago, uh, we received this uh, tract in the mail um, from a guy that's in a uh, Hutterite commune someplace. Uh, he told me that he's born again and things, and, and from his testimony, I think that he could be. I'm not going to say yes or no because I don't really know him personally all that well. Um, but he, you know, got out and then he went back in for a little bit and stuff like this. And he's, you know, doesn't agree with a lot of what's going on there and whatever else. I don't know. Um, but he sent me this and he said, could you do a video on this thing? So finally getting around to it. Um, sorry about that. It took me a while. But, uh, you know, just one of them things. Been real busy. And uh, this thing here, uh, I could spend a whole lot of time on it. But there's a few things that you need to understand about the eternal security issue. And once you understand, say it this way. Um, when you get saved, you will be grounded. The Lord will he'll ground you in a couple very fundamental basic truths. All right. Uh, truth number one is you have a written standard. Okay. Things have to line up with this written standard. All right. If somebody tells you something and you go, Where's that at in Scripture? Well, it's not in the Bible, technically, but you should believe it because I said so. Uh, no, sorry, not going to happen. Okay? Um, and, you know, salvation produces a changed life. All right? Obviously. There's no point in getting saved if you don't have a changed life. You know, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. And again, I've done this, you know, talked about this in other studies at great length, so I'm not going to go over it again. But um, another thing is eternal security. And if you have eternal security, then it's Jesus Christ paid the price for my sin on the cross, and I'm going to go to heaven, be not because of what I'm doing, but because of what He did for me. So if I'm saying I have to do anything in a continuing sense to merit my salvation, well, then I haven't put my faith truly in Jesus Christ. See? It's very simple. It's not that difficult. And this type of a thing here will go through all kinds of arguments and all kinds of scriptures and things like this to try and confuse people. And uh, and you're going to see it comes back to this thing of he thinks... I mean, you're not going to believe what this guy says in this tract. Uh, it's, it's pretty bad. But uh, it comes back to him believing he's working his way to heaven is what it is. And a lot of these religious communes, uh, the Amish... I remember talking to an Amishman in the state of Maine here, and he told me, he said uh, that the most serious heresy out there right now, today, is this damnable heresy of eternal security. You know, why? Well, because he's working his way to heaven. And I told him that. And he got offended. You know, which, you know, I lose a lot of sleep over that when people get offended at what I say. But, uh, yeah, you aren't going to believe what's in this. So let's take a look at this. I'll show you here on the overhead camera. Eternal security, is it biblical? Are millions misled by this doctrine? Over 70 scriptures which deny this doctrine inside. Yeah, let's see about this. Okay. <clears throat> Get my Bible out of the way. Danger of the unconditional eternal security belief. Millions today believe the doctrine of unconditional eternal security. They believe that once a person is saved from sin, it is impossible, impossible to be lost in hell. That's absolutely true. Since they believe it is impossible to be lost, they live an ungodly, sinful life. <laughs> okay? Exactly what a lot of these people teach. They say, you know, somebody's living wickedly and horribly and in sin and things like this, uh, then that's because they believe in eternal security. Uh, or it could be because they were never really saved in the first place. You know, a victim of easy believism that's doing all kinds of horrible, wicked stuff. And you're going to see here, by the way, that he does teach sinless perfection. You're going to see it. And, you know, again, let me just say, say it for the record. I do not teach sinless perfection. I never have and I never will. All right. You will sin. There's a changed life after salvation. But part of that changed life is you're going to have conviction for the sins that you commit. You're not going to enjoy certain things that you used to do back in the lost life. All right, well, let's get back to it here. Others live a good moral life but disobey God's commands once in a while. Both depend upon a past experience for salvation. Yet this is not the teaching of Scripture. 
okay. Um, Jesus dying on the cross is not what paid for my sin. It's a past experience. I put my faith in Him back many years ago now. Yeah. Check this out. The Scripture teaches that not only must a person be born again, but a person must also endure to the end to be saved. Matthew 24, verse 13. Oh, isn't that nice? And you're going to see that this guy here in this tract and also anybody else that denies eternal security, they are always going to be non-dispensational. Again, you know, people say, oh, you know, you can be non-dispensational and be saved. No, you can't. No, you can't. You can't. You can't just say, I can pick any verse out of Scripture and it applies to me doctrinally. Uh, no, it does not. All right? Uh, you got to be real careful with that thing. And, you know, I, I see people and they'll say, well, you know, but the Bible teaches that, you know, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Yes, that's very true. But it also teaches in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you say, well, they, they, they cancel each other out. No, they line up together. It's called dispensationalism. There are doctrines that overlap dispensational lines. There are certain doctrines that will be true in any dispensation. Okay? God's grace is always going to be there in any dispensation. All right. The way he dispenses salvation is different in each dispensation. Some people. But, you know, again, going to Matthew chapter 24, before Jesus died on the cross, and this is doctrine for us today. See how it gets people messed up? But let's continue. If the eternal security belief is wrong, it is dooming millions in our churches today. Not only is this doctrine damning millions, it is also undermining the church, making it the deadliest belief in America today. I challenge you to study the Word of God to find the truth for yourselves, or will you be one of the lost? We'll see how he says to be saved here in a little bit. Scripture does teach about Christian security, but it also teaches that a person who has been saved may choose to later fall from grace. Okay? Um, it's funny. Because he says it teaches Christian security, but he doesn't give any scriptures to prove it. And he never once quotes Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 13, I think it is. Let me just check real quickly. It's Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4. I get some of my numbers mixed up sometimes. Um, try to make sure my quotations are correct. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed, meaning you can't lose your salvation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day, unto the day of redemption. You're sealed. When you sin, you only grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You'll be chastened for that. But you don't lose your salvation. Why? Because it's not your salvation. It's the salvation that God provides through Jesus Christ. If I was believing in my salvation, well then yes, I would be headed to hell. I'm believing in the salvation that Jesus Christ offered. Give me a scripture on that. Okay. Titus chapter 3. Verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And when he says about fallen from grace, you know, fallen from grace there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, yes, you can fall from grace. That doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. That means you are messing around in sin. You are starting to get messed up doctrinally, which is the context of Galatians chapter 5. They're thinking that they're going back under the law. And Paul is saying, okay, then you're falling from grace. <laughs> if you're justified by the law, you're going into the whole works thing. It's kind of funny. Paul's actually rebuking what this guy's trying to teach in this wicked tract. But let's continue. It is necessary for a person to live a holy life if he intends to make it into heaven. Those who sin will have their names blotted out of the book of life. 
Exodus chapter 32, verse 33. Wow, so we're actually Jews under the law back in the Old Testament. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> you know? I mean, good night. I got to get down to, I mean, tomorrow. Oh, nuts. Tomorrow's Sunday. I, I, today's Saturday. Oh, I forgot to take my animals in and get them sacrificed at the temple by the Levitical priesthood. <laughs> Non-dispensationalists are, are nuts. And I'm being nice on that. But let's continue here. It is possible to fall from salvation, he says here. Galatians 5, verse 4, yeah, sure. The Bible says it is possible to fall from grace. Grace is not the same as salvation. Romans chapter 11, verse 19 through 22, you also will be cut off. If a person does not continue to believe, God will cut him off. That's not the context of that. It's saying if you go against Israel, then you're cut off. Again, he's lying here. Revelation 3, verse 5, blot, out his, or blot his name out of the book of life. This passage teaches God will blot some names out of the book of life. And that is true, right there. But is that for us today, in this dispensation? Well, you're going to see here in just a little bit, he quotes Revelation chapter 22 about adding to and taking away from the Word of God, and then he, continue, then he proceeds to add to and take away from the Word of God in his own tract. You know? And I mean, those verses, I'm not going to change them and say, you know, well, they, they actually are trying to say, those are, those are verses I don't mess with, okay? Changing God's word, going against the Jewish people. Uh, I have a whole study on the whole thing of eternal security. And, you know, I've had brethren try to say, oh, brother, you know, you got to teach this eternal security. You know, it's just total there. And, and, and I do, I do. I am, you know, I, that's what the point of me doing this video. I do believe in eternal security. But, you know, when I look in Romans chapter 11, it's talking about you're being cut off, you know. Uh, and it's just like, you, just, and, you know, I've had brethren say, well, brother, that's that's nationally speaking. Okay, still it's a bad thing, you know. I'm, I, you know, I don't believe that a Christian can lose their salvation, you know. But I'm looking at this stuff and I'm going, you know, I mean, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to change the text? I just look and I say, honestly, I don't know what those two. But you see... Here's the point, because people say, well, then you've lost the whole argument, it, you know, which has always amazed me. You, you, you know, you have a couple verses and, and you have a, you know, I'm trying to be honest and say, I honestly don't know. And they go, well, then you've lost the whole thing. You know, I can prove scripture after scripture after scripture that documents eternal security. And I can disprove all this guy's arguments, but he'll say two verses. And I say, yeah, I, you know, that one, I don't know. And it's like, well, then you lost everything. And by the way, it's funny because these people, they teach that if you mess up, if you sin, then you can get, you can come back and, you know, you just backslid a little bit and you can go and you can be saved again. It's nutty. Let's continue. Exodus chapter 32, verse 33. Whosoever hath sinned him will I blot out of my book. Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 through 39. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. Again, both of these are talking about people in the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, not for Christians. That's why it's called Hebrews. Ezekiel 3, verse 20. Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 27. You know, sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. You know, everybody does that. Everybody sins willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth. Unless you're this guy, he's sinlessly perfect. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul says, Lest I be a castaway. <laughs> okay? The word castaway is generally translated reprobate. No, it's not. It's translated castaway. In other words, you can mess around with the flesh and you can basically ruin your life. It's like a shipwreck, you know? God's helping you along through the waters and all of a sudden you just go, Pff, and everything falls apart and your, your marriage fell apart and your finances are just in disarray and you're living on the street and this and that and you know yeah you can make a mess of your life that's what the scripture is saying there it's not saying that paul lost or that somebody could lose their salvation nonsense but see you had to change the word of god it's a generally translated reprobate just change the word of god 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, our labor be in vain. How could Paul's labor have been in vain if backsliding was not possible? 
Okay, Paul's saying, I don't want to waste my time on you if uh, if you're going to get messed up in these different things here. Okay, he's not. There's nothing about losing salvation there. <laughs> Revelation 22 verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And this guy does in the tract. So he just cut his own throat. Our behavior determines our destiny. Oh, ugh. your behavior determines your destiny? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, if our behavior determined our destiny, we would all be in hell. All right, Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, that and what you do about that, uh, you know, that's what determines your eternity. You know, you come to the Lord in a broken, contrite spirit, not in your pride, not in self-righteousness, or not in a mocking tone like a lot of atheists will do. I've seen atheists and they'll pray the prayer of salvation. And, oh, Jesus, I believe in you and I receive you and stuff. They're not sincere. They're lying. See, you come to the Lord broken with a contrite spirit. In other words, contrition means that you are sorry for your sin and you want to do something to atone for that sin. As far as I want to change my life. I don't want to keep living like this. You know, and I'm not saying you clean your whole life up. Uh-uh. You just come with broken and say, God, I need your help. And I want to I'm gonna put my faith completely in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross to pay for my sins, his death, burial, and resurrection. All right? It's not uh, your behavior that determines your destiny. Unless you want to go to hell. Then it is your behavior that determines your destiny. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith Lord or Lord will enter into the enter the kingdom of but he that doeth the will of my Father. Obedience is also required for entry to heaven. I uh, don't think so. Romans 2, verses 5 through 6. God will render to every man according to his deeds. Read the context. Our eternal destiny is based upon our deeds. No, it isn't. Nothing to do with that. This passage is a direct attack against eternal security. Well, let's look at that. I'm trying to get through this thing fast because I've covered these scriptures so many times. You know... And I could sit down. We could go over every single argument here and things like this. But yeah, you know, it's it's so absurd. It's just like, yeah, okay. Romans chapter two, uh, verses five through six. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness and indignation and wrath, I'm, I'm continuing to read here, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory and honor, glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there's no respect of persons with God. All right? It's talking about there, in context, it's talking about if you get saved and you're messing around with the flesh. All right? These, these people, they have no idea, they have no perception of this. It's just incredible. Hebrews 5, 9 through 10, eternal salvation to they, those who obey God. To be saved in the end requires one to obey. Again, you know, see these these people, they, they change the word of God just like crazy. And I'm going, what does the verse actually say? It's just, it's incredible. I'm going to look this one up real quick. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, what? how do you obey Jesus Christ? By putting your faith in him. Again, it's, Jesus didn't come to set up a perpetual system of good works. James 2, 14 through 26, another one of the favorites of the Catholics, they'll do this one. Faith if it hath not works, have, hath not works, I think it is. Let me just look this one up quickly. I'm right near it here. So James 2 verse 14 is where he begins. Uh, 
Yeah. Check this out. That's what I thought. I thought that doesn't sound right. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. He changes the word of God. Right there. <laughs> yeah, okay. A real spiritual man here, you know. I mean, change the Word of God to suit your doctrines and things like this, and then say anybody that changes the Word of God goes to hell. Yeah. And by the way, the thing in James there, read James chapter 1, verse 1. James to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Okay, again, it's a, a book for the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, Jews, essentially. Romans 10, verse 9, If thou shalt, or if thou shalt, he's changing it again, believe, and confess thou shalt be saved. Uh, change it again. Believing confession of Christ and repentance are works a person must do to be saved. A person must continue to keep those these same requirements to stay saved. <laughs> okay? Scripture teaches a life of faith along with an initial experience. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Uh, okay? You're going to have to have faith in the Lord answering your prayers and faith in, in a lot of things. That doesn't mean that you're doing that to merit salvation. This guy's desperate. Scriptures which state who is not a Christian. Romans 8, 9. Without the Spirit of Christ, we do not uh, belong to God. Those who live wickedly do not have the Spirit, and they are spiritually dead. It's talking about if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You know, I think is what the verse is. Let's see, this guy's changing scripture. I'm just going like, what's the, you know, it's amazing when these people change scriptures and stuff. Like you hear somebody quote a new version and in your mind you're going, wait a second, what, how, does it, how does the scripture go in the King James? Like it just, it messes your head up. Yeah, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. All right, again, I'll show you this, how this guy changes it. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Without the Spirit of Christ, we do not belong to God. That's not at all what the text says. The guy's a stinking liar. Absolutely incredible. All right. 2 John 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. John says that those who do not keep the commands or true doctrine are not Christians. Uh, that's not at all what he's saying. 1 John 3, 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Okay, the passage there is talking about Jesus Christ and how his righteousness is imputed to us. Again, that's something that these people have no clue about. I mean, again, it's talking to the Amish guy, and I was like, do you know what imputation is? No, you know, and I'm like, imputation is Christ's righteousness is given to you at salvation. He, his, his life, his sinless life is, imply, or is applied to you. It's imparted to you, imputed, I'll say it that way, and your sinful life goes upon him on the cross. I had no idea about these things. 1 John 5.18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. John clearly teaches that Christians do not sin. Well, that would contradict other scriptures. You compare scripture with scripture, you see. And again, when it's talking there in 1 John 5.18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Read the context. It's talking about because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. All right. Again, I've done studies on that. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Anyone who is genu genuinely saved lives a transformed life. Well, of course. But that's not to stay saved. Right? That's proof of true conversion. Something will change. Right? Check this one out. What must a person do to enter heaven? No fornicator, unclean person, covetous, or idolater will inherit the kingdom of God. A person must not commit these sins. All right. Uh, well, first of all, the kingdom of God is, is a reference to the spiritual fellowship. Let me show you that real quick. Romans chapter, let's see where it's at here. 
Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's fellowship between you and the Lord. That's what the kingdom of God is. So, again, you know, let's go to Ephesians 5, 5 here. you got to be so careful. See, that's the thing. I mean, this type of thing. I'm, I'm showing you this out there. Because you need to check these things out. I'm just doing a quick little review of this wicked tract thing. But when you get something like this, look up the scriptures and see how the, this guy's changing it. Uh, this, you know, no fornicator. Uh, wait a second here. Ephesians 5.5, 5. let me just show you here. He says, No fornicator, unclean person, covetous, or idolater will inherit the kingdom of God. This you know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person. He changed it again. Nor unclean person, takes out nor. Nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, Christ and of God. It's not talking about. Look at it. I mean, look how this guy changes the, the text. Will inherit the kingdom of God. Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ and of God. I mean, the guy is changing the word of God and then saying anybody that changes the word of God loses their salvation. Continue. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. No one looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. A person must not have changed his mind about being a Christian. Okay. John 5, 29. Wicked resurrected unto judgment. A person who is wicked will be condemned. Yeah. Every tree not bearing good fruit is cast into the fire. Yeah, okay. Again, just like, I'm just going, okay. You can see he's taking whole things out of the scripture there. I mean, it's just like... You know, and, and you go, well, you should be answering every single one of these objections. Okay, but we're going back to the same over and over and over the same thing. Did Jesus save you? Or are you saving yourself? It's that simple. It's just that simple. And you say, well, you've got to answer all my things. You know, devils like this, this guy here that wrote that tract, um, devils like that will just continually argue and argue and argue and argue and argue with you. And that's why you just got to say, okay, you know what? You know, I know what the Bible teaches. You didn't even bring up Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, or four, chapter 4, verse 30. You didn't even talk about that. And there's a lot of other stuff that you've left out of this. Um, a lot of your arguments are really ridiculous. And, you're, and we're going back to this thing of, did Jesus die and pay for your sins completely? Or are you paying for your sins and living this godly, holy life without sinning to merit your salvation? See, it's really not that difficult. And like I said, I'm not going to go over all these scriptures. It's just, it'd take way too long. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 21, It is better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to turn from the holy commandment. Uh, and he says the Bible teaches that backsliders go to hell. Otherwise, going to heaven would make their end better. Uh, that's not at all what the passage is talking about there. It's talking about people that have known the way of righteousness. It's head knowledge, but they were never truly saved. That's what the context of the Second Peter chapter 2 is all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Nor list of ten sins shall inherit the kingdom of God. We conclude one cannot be presently living a sinful life, and especially in the act of committing sin to go to heaven. The context is of a church. Uh, which has members that have started living a wicked life. Uh, now it's talking about the First Corinthians chapter six. There is talking about um, joining up, yoking up in worship with lost people. That's what's talking about. And again, the kingdom of God there is talking about that spiritual fellowship with the Lord. Psalm twenty-four verse three. I mean, this, this kind of stuff makes me tired. It's crazy. You know, it's just like like I said, you, you know, you're reading it and you're going, hey, that's not what the Bible says, you know. Psalm 24, verse 3. 
Who shall ascend into the, whole, the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And that proves you can lose your salvation, that uh, the salvation that wasn't there at the writing of Psalm 24, but let's not concern ourselves with such details. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, being holy in life and heart is necessary to see God. Okay. Answers to Calvinistic Objections. Some say once a person is born into the family of God, he or she cannot be unborn. This is not a quote from Scripture. Remember that. This is not a quote from Scripture. The opposite of birth is death, not being unborn. And the Bible teaches that a person who has been born may die spiritually. Genesis 2.17 <laughs> so, so now we're back in the Garden of Eden. Whoa. The doctrines and the, the salvation that was there in the Garden of Eden, it's good for us today. Whew. Yeah. Continue. In addition, we all originally had the devil as our father. John 8.44 through God's grace, we have been delivered or unborn from the devil's family. Up here he says, this is not a quote from Scripture. And then he gives a quote down here that is not found anywhere in Scripture. Yeah. Some say a person cannot backslide because John 10.28 says a person cannot be plucked out of God's hand. The verse is not addressing falling from grace, but showing God's power to keep us in persecution. It does not say that a person may not choose to leave God's hand. Okay. In addition, the previous verse teaches that this promise applies only to those who are following Christ. Anyone who does not follow Christ is not one of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know him. I know them and they follow me. Uh, yeah, okay. Let me just show you something here very interesting, uh, which this... Trying to think of where the scriptures at. I uh, have to find it here. I'm not sure where it is. I'm trying to think right now. Well, I'm not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to keep this thing fairly short. But it's the scripture talks about that God measures out this the universe with the span of His hand from here to here, like that. So. He measures the universe with the span of his hand. You're in his hand, and you can choose there. What did he say exactly? Um, you may choose to leave God's hand. I heard a brother from down south one time, Mitch Knup, it was his name, and he said, he said, you think that you can get out of, you know, you can leave God's hand? Better start walking. <laughs> it's from the south, yeah. Better start walking, you know. Yeah, I mean, when, when God measures the universe with his hand, and you think that you can leave that, um, got a long walk ahead of you. Let's continue here. Some say if we are required to behave a certain way, it is salvation by works. No, absolutely not. Anyone that is saved finds salvation by grace through faith alone. Okay. The question is not what must be done to obtain salvation, but what must be done to keep saved. Oh, brother. James teaches that a person's works is evidence of that person's state of, of grace. Gives the scripture. Even those who believe in eternal security teach that a person must do works to be saved. Namely, believe in God. That's works. Okay. Uh, Romans 1.17 teaches that not only is initial faith necessary, but that a person must continue to exercise faith to be a Christian. This verse states that the just shall live by faith. Oh, brother. <laughs> but I say the best part for last. Okay, the last paragraph is the, this is the classic one right here. This one is a good laugh. Okay, check this one out. Number four here on the back. Some teach that everyone sins, not if a proper definition of sin is used. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Are you a sinner? How do you define sin? <laughs> not if I define it my way yeah sure C 
sin is designed as a willful transgression of the known law of God. Uh huh. And yes, it is possible to live without sinning. Check it out. I can testify to this. And I also know numerous others who can. No, we are not super saints. You would be if you can live without sinning. God enables us and can help any person to live this way. Twice, Christ told us those to whom he had ministered to to go and sin no more. Meaning, when Jesus is talking like that, he's saying, what you're doing there, don't do that again. He's not saying live perfectly sinless, you know. Um, I mean, the Bible teaches all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But not according to this guy. He hasn't. And as long as you define sin his way. I mean, things like gluttony and things like that, well, that's not technically under his definition of sin or, or uh, you know, covetousness or, or uh, pride, I'm sure, you know. He wouldn't have any pride. No, never. But let's uh, look here at his scripture list for continued study. Backsliding taught. Hebrews goes and mess, messes up with different dis dispensations. James, Revelation, First Chronicles. Ezekiel, defining Christians, continued faith required, good behavior required, all over the place, back to Psalm 24, all kinds of stuff here before Jesus died on the cross, Malachi chapter 4 verse 1, you know, overcoming sin required, and there's so many things I could say about all this stuff too, I mean it's just like, whatever, you can look at this, but uh, here's the interesting part about this. Check this out. I looked up this guy online. The Reverend Spencer Johnson here just died November 5th, 2016. He's in hell. You say, well, brother, do you know for He's in hell. He trusted in his own self-righteousness. I guarantee you he's in hell. Right? What if he had to change? What if he, you know, deathbed confession? And what do we do? Well, I don't count on those things. And if I'm going to be any kind of a preacher, and if you're going to be any kind of a Christian, you don't count on those things either. You say the kind of people who put this stuff out are lost. You need to put your faith completely in Jesus Christ, not in your own righteousness. So, that's enough for that. Um, you know, the Bible teaches eternal security for a Christian. Uh, you start getting into some of the other dispensation stuff. Yeah, there's there's issues there. And, I mean, you know, people make the argument, well, you know, Romans chapter 11 is, you know, talking about a nation being cut off, national privileges being cut off, and Revelation 22, Revelation, you know, verses 18 and 19, Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, I think it is, um, they say, well, that's actually for saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, fine. Um, if that's the case... If those things apply to us at all today, I'd say, you know, eh, be real careful with that. I, I you know, but, uh, you know, from the Pauline epistles, what's in the Pauline epistles? Eternal security, 100% eternal security. Uh, so, you know, again, there's there's these videos that they circulate. I mean, you can cut up people's videos, make them say anything. And they cut my video and stuff, and they, they, they don't give the whole argument. You know, they show a little bit where I'm saying, you know, years ago, actually, in this very room, and I'm going... You know, I don't know. It's possible a Christian could lose their salvation if they go against the Jews and if they mess around with God's word. It's something I'm not going to mess with. You know, I can't, I'm not going to distort the scriptures to try and teach eternal security, you know, in every single case. You know, I'm just, I don't know. You know, is it a sin for me to say I don't know? You know, I mean, it's it's like this unpardonable sin or something like this, you know, if if Brother Brian says that he doesn't know every scripture, you know, I mean, he's not allowed to do that. Uh, I just, I look at it and I say, man, I'm not going to mess around with the Jews and I'm not, certainly not going to change God's word. Uh, but I teach eternal security. Absolutely, I teach eternal security. So, that's going to be that. Uh, watch out for stuff like this. Just insane. Um, that's going to be it for now, I guess. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I needed to say on that study. I don't think so. So, I guess I'll see you in the next study. Thank you for watching.